Pat Paradis, and I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for Constitutional Studies here. Uh, it, this is an academic centre in the Faculty of Law. And um, we are very, very pleased to have two experts from our faculty with us today to explain the consequences of the Daniels decision. Uh, the case was the culmination of 12 years of litigation between the federal government, individual litigants, and the Congress of Aboriginal People. Uh, and it, was, it dealt with the important question of whether Métis people and non-status Aboriginal people are considered Indians under the uh, Section 91 sub 24 of our Constitution. The case was just appealed this week, actually, uh, to the Federal Court of Appeal by the Government of Canada. So each of our presenters is going to speak for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to open the floor to questions. And uh, so you'll have ample opportunity to ask uh, questions if you have any. So I'll begin with Eric Adams, who is an associate professor in the Faculty of Law and a constitutional historian. He was in private practice uh, and worked for several years on the Daniels case. So he is going to tell us what Daniels is about, how history influenced the outcome of the case, and he will explore some of the problems and puzzles that the case presents. Catherine Bell is a professor in the Faculty of Law and a very well-respected expert in the field of Canadian law as it applies to Aboriginal people, and she has particular expertise on Métis rights and First Nations cultural heritage rights. She will be speaking about some of the potential implications of the Daniels case uh, if it is upheld on appeal. She brings particular insight in light of the work she's done with Alberta's Métis settlements, the Métis Nation, and both the federal and provincial governments. So without further ado, over to you, Professor Adams. Thanks uh, very much, Pat, and uh, thanks uh, to all for being here. It's a terrific uh, audience, and I'm really pleased to be uh, speaking today on this uh, fascinating, interesting uh, topic. Lots of uh, seats, so come on in and just uh, find yourself wherever you can uh, grab a seat. So um, Catherine and I uh, did a radio spot uh, on this topic on CBC Radio a few days ago. And at the end of it, um, Kathy said to me, I, I think we make a good dog and pony show. And then uh, we got into a debate about wh which was the dog and who was the <laughs> pony. So um, I won't tell you my view, but if you have uh, ideas on that, I'd love to hear them at the conclusion of these remarks. And I hope there's lots of time for other kinds of, of questions as, as well. I want to say by way of opening, uh, as Pat mentioned, that uh, I represented uh, the plaintiffs uh, for a short time at the early stage of this litigation uh, when I was in private practice. I have, I have not been involved in this case since uh, 2006, and none of my comments today uh, reflect any of the views of the, of the plaintiffs. I'm speaking in my personal capacity, um, nor my co-counsel, nor the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples. I, I am speaking as an academic, even though I was formally associated with the, with the case. Um, in the, in the mid-1940s, the federal government embarked on an ambitious project to update the Indian Act and to amend and revise the banned lists which determine status under that Act. The effort was motivated, at least in part, by desire to reduce the number of status Indians entitled to receive benefits under the statute. They were trying to cut costs. At an Indian agents conference held in Quebec City in June 1947, Malcolm McCrimmon, uh, chief of the Reserve Division, told uh, uh, of a recent success in northern Alberta, where he boasted, we have recently had 664 people removed from banned lists over a period of only five years. He sent forth the other Indian agents out into, into, uh, Canada, in, into Canada to similarly reduce ban lists. In Nova Scotia, this comprised the work for, for two Indian agents who had to cover uh, 30 reserves across that province. And in the course of revising their ban lists, uh, Indians, Aboriginal persons, were systematically missed, left off the lists. 
It was simply impossible for them to accurately catalog and categorize and list uh, the many thousands of people who claimed Aboriginal status. But there was a bigger problem than that. As one of those Nova Scotia Indian agents wrote to Ottawa, nobody, nobody seems to know who are and who are not Indians. That question, who are and who are not Indians, that plagued this effort in the 1940s, remains with us in a constitutional sense today. Who are constitutional Indians? That, in essence, I think is what the Daniels decision is all about. And it's one that uh, I think will reach the steps of the Supreme Court of Canada in the years ahead. So in my brief remarks today, I want to provide an overview of that case. And I want to make some observations about the nature of the constitutional and historical dilemmas posed by the decision. And I know my co-presenter, Kathy Bell, will have much more to say on uh, many of the issues as they relate to the, to the Métis and the, and the possible uh, and potential ramifications of the decision itself. The original lead plaintiff in this case uh, was an individual known to, to maybe some of you, Harry Daniels, the former president of the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, a group representing non-status Indians in Canada. Non-status Indians are persons who identify as Aboriginal, but who do not have formal status under the Federal Indian Act. These Aboriginal persons lost status, or their families lost status, through a variety of ways uh, over the century. Some by marriage with uh, non-Aboriginal persons, uh, some uh, uh, under the enfranch enfranchisement statutes, which forced or encouraged Aboriginal peoples to lose and give up status. Some because of generational drift away from their historic communities and into, into cities. Whatever the reason, there are hundreds of thousands of non-status Aboriginal peoples in Canada today. And many of them um, are associated uh, with uh, the, the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples. Mr. Daniels, who identified as a non-status Indian, died in 2004, but the case that bears his name was continued uh, with other individual plaintiffs as well as the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples. The Métis, which are part of this case, uh, in ways that we'll explain in a minute, minute are, are distinct from this group of non-status Indians. Sometimes the term Métis is used simply to refer to someone of mixed Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal descent, uh, but more specifically the Métis nation refers to a, a distinct political historic community of persons associated with uh, the Red River settlement in Manitoba and then across the North uh, West. Uh, this group of peoples has always claimed very distinct status as Métis, and, and, and that has ramifications, I think, for this case that we'll explore. Well, the individual plaintiffs, what did they want in this case? They wanted what's called a constitutional declaration. They wanted the court to say that this was the constitutional state of affairs and leave for another day what the ramifications of that would be. They sought three declarations from the court. One was that Métis and non-status Indians, these two groups of Aboriginal peoples, were Indians within the meaning of this constitutional section. Section 9124 of the Constitution Act of 1867. And in the Constitution Act of 1867, the Constitution divides power between the federal and the provincial governments, and Section 9124 grants jurisdiction over Indians and lands reserved for the Indians. Now, what does that mean? Well, the plaintiffs in Daniel said that definition of Indian in section 9124 must include Métis and non-status peoples. They also argued to other, sought two other declarations that Canada had fiduciary obligations to Métis and non-status people, that Canada had a duty to consult uh, Métis and non-status peoples when their interests were affected. And so I don't leave you hanging. The court said yes to the first declaration. Yes, Métis and non-status peoples fall within section 9124 and we'll leave to another day those other two declarations that were sought. We don't know about the fiduciary duties. We don't know about the du duty to consult. That will be resolved on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis in the future. Well, early in his reasons, Justice Phelan uh, recognized that, that there was a, a problem of, of, of language to, to deal with. It is a definitional minefield, he said. 
to use terms like Indian or Aboriginal when you're trying to define who is um, an Indian. I think there were more minefields than that than Justice Phelan uh, recognized. It's a problem that lurks throughout the case uh, and in the nature of the problem itself. The exercise of top-down racial classification in a constitutional context. The document says Indian and who is an Indian. The language of the Constitution Act of 1867 is, is that of the 19th century. And so are many of its ideas, that people can be classified by race. The term and the racialized thinking behind it are an attempt to cram a diverse body of people, the Aboriginal peoples of Canada, into a single category. And doesn't leave much space for the way that people want to identify themselves. The First Nations who might prefer to be known as Mi'kmaq or Anishinaabe or Nishka or Métis, right, are simply crammed into this single racial category. And yet there's no escaping the constitutional text and the language that we're left with. So as lawyers, we speak the language of, of Indian, even though that, that has passed from, from popular uh, use. And even though these groups would prefer, quite justifiably, to be known by their own identities and labels and, and terms. The law imposes uh, this language upon them, and it's what we have to deal with. But what did this category then of Indian mean when it was created in 1867, and what does it mean today? That was the legal problem that was uh, posed. Well, Canadian courts have a, a complicated and not totally resolved relationship to answering basic questions like this about the meaning of the Constitution. How should they interpret what that section means, section 9124? Courts are, have been clear that the meaning of uh, the terms in the Constitution are not limited to what they meant in 1867. So the criminal law, which is, which is another enumerated uh, power in, in Section 91, does not mean what was criminal in 1867. That category can grow and change over time. The definition of marriage can grow and change over time. We're not limited to understandings of 1867. And in aid of that uh, uh, idea, the courts have invoked the living tree, and that's the image on the screen, the living tree of the Constitution. It can grow, it can change, it can develop, as long as it remains within its natural limits. But what role should the constitutional framers, the other figures in that image, play in this interpretive exercise? What about their ideas about what they meant? in 1867. Now in America, right, the American Supreme Court has a, has a much stronger history of the power of originalism and originalist intent on constitutional doctrine. And in Canada, courts have said, well, we don't, we don't follow that strict kind of originalism. And yet, many of these cases invariably come back to the question, well, what did they mean in 1867? That is the starting point of the analysis. And in this particular case, Daniels, over 175 pages, you see that history is front and center, the driving force in determining what that term uh, meant. As the Supreme Court has recently held, constitutional language must be anchored in the historical context of the provision. In practice, that means in some cases, historical evidence matters a great deal in determining the interpretation of the section at issue. So we know that original intent does matter in determining constitutional meaning, and we also know that original intent is not the only thing that defines what a text means, and what is the balance between those two forces. One looking to the past, the other looking to the future. It depends on the judge in the particular case. This was a case where the pull of the past, or the, or the push of history, as I've called it, was very powerful in, uh, indeed. So in, in Daniels, uh, Justice Phelan notes right at the outset that history was going to play a major role. It certainly played an overwhelming role in how the case was argued. And as the slide mentions, there were uh, seven expert witnesses virtually all of them 
trained uh, historians. Uh, there was thousands and thousands of documents, many of which I uh, reviewed. Um, there were six weeks of uh, evidence uh, given, 800 exhibits. But more than that, it was the expanse of the canvas that all of Canadian history in relation to Aboriginal <laughs> peoples was painted in this trial. It's really quite a remarkable decision to read just for the glimpses of, of Canadian uh, history that you can get in its pages. Now, what made this particular case more difficult, despite all this history, was that there is absolutely no history about what they were thinking when they passed this provision. So at the Charlottetown Conference in 1864, the Quebec Conference of 1864, the London Conference of 1866, not a single framer left a single record to explain what they meant by Indian. And so the court needed to look around and across time to find that meaning. Well, the reason they didn't talk about it wasn't because the issue was not important. The issue of, of how to deal with the Aboriginal peoples at Confederation was critically important to the, to the framers. And it wasn't the case that, that, the, that the framers of Confederation had no experience dealing with Aboriginal matters. They did in their, in their capacity as, as officials in colonial governments. They dealt repeatedly and often with a variety of Aboriginal peoples. And so it was to this history that the court turned. What kind of statutes dealt with Indians before Confederation? And they found many that defined Indians. And what they found in those statutes was that Indians were, was invariably defined broadly. Broadly to include people of both uh, mixed descent and those who were living among uh, Indians uh, in what they would have called at the time sort of the Indian way of life. And what the pre-Confederation records also revealed was that in the, in the treaty relationships between the Crown and, and Aboriginal peoples, there were often uh, groups of mixed ancestry peoples that were in, involved in the treaties. Indeed, a number of people that negotiated the Robinson-Huron treaties, as, or Robinson-Superior treaties in Ontario, were of mixed descent. What also became clear in the evidence was that distinctions sometimes mattered a great deal to the uh, government officials of the day. Sometimes they tried very hard to categorize people into various kinds of racial categories. These people were pure Indians. These people were not quite pure Indians. These people were, in the racist language of the day, half-breeds or etc. Right? Sometimes these categories mattered a great deal. And what the government of Canada tried to argue was that these categories were evidence that the distinctions really did matter, mattered uh, to government officials and must have, when they used the word Indian, they must have meant this more narrow definition. And I think the court rejects that argument, and rightly so, because even though there was this effort to categorize, what really matters to government officials, the history reveals, is that there was a group that were not white. And this group was, in some varying degree, Indian, whether they were pure Indian, or what they called half-breeds, whether they were Métis or not. What unified that other group was a kind of connection to, to Aboriginal heritage. And that's what mattered, I think, to government officials uh, more often than it, it didn't. The other uh, piece of evidence that the, the court turned to after canvassing all of this history and, and trying to determine how Indians were defined uh, in, in and around 1867 was to look at, well, why would they have given the power over Indians to the federal government in the first place? What was their intention and what was the reason for doing so? And they looked both to, to the purpose of Section 9124 and the purpose of Confederation itself. And again, when they looked into that history, they found plenty of ammunition for the claim that Indians had a broad meaning in 9124. So first to the definition or the, the, the purpose of confederation. What were they trying to do? Well, they were trying to create a, a nation, a nation that would have um, an economic engine to span the, the continent, Ep economic networks that would span east to west and would secure 
Canada, uh, both in a military way from the Americans, but also economically as it grew and developed. But part of that mission then meant opening up the lands of the west, of the prairies, um, to this development. How are you going to get a railway across Canada if there is uncertainty about, about the aboriginal title to those lands? And what the federal government wanted, what the federal government needed, was the ability to, to extinguish what they called Indian title. And Indian title was something that the government recognized that all manner of Aboriginal people possessed. Métis possessed Indian title, Aboriginal peoples or Indians possessed Indian title, and the government needed to extinguish that title to develop its confederation aims. It would only have made sense then, given those aims, to have the power reside in the federal government to extinguish that title, to deal with a broad diversity of Aboriginal peoples. Section 9124 also had uh, racist undertones in that part of the government agenda would have been, and they were explicit about this, to assimilate these populations into the broader Canadian fabric with the Enfranchisement Acts that said the goal is that you should lose status, you should destroy the, the Indian uh, over time. That was an explicit goal of government policy. They wanted to do that whether this, these groups were Métis, whether they were Indian, whether they were living on the land, whether li they were living in cities. And again, that goal, which I think is a disturbing one, but nonetheless, that goal would have required the government to have jurisdiction over all manner of Aboriginal uh, peoples. I think the history is really compelling then. It's, it's almost impossible to escape that the government had this broad idea of Indian in mind when it crafted section 9124. And it was only when the power over Indians became to represent more than simply the ability to control, when the power over Indians also became a fiscal matter that cost the government money, that the government began to think maybe there wasn't such an advantage to having broad jurisdiction over all manner of, of Aboriginal peoples. Maybe a narrower conception of Indian would be more fiscally prudent, would be more appropriate, and we see over time the government shifting its conception of how to define uh, Indian. There's much more to be said about this fascinating uh, case, and I hope that comes out in, in the questions, and I know um, Kathy's got lots to say about the potential implications. But if, as I think is likely, the courts will uphold Justice Phelan's decision, I think a new set of constitutional questions will invariably arise, not so much who is a constitutional Indian, but what are the burdens and benefits, rights and responsibilities that flow from that status. So with that, I'll hand things over to Kathy. Thank you very much. And then I'll move forward. And one of the reasons, um, first of all, I want to say, wow, thanks for coming. <laughs> it's so nice to see so many people here. And um, so many of you are my friends from a long time ago, so it's really, really nice to see you here. And uh, some of you are people from the Métis community that I have worked with or I have yet to meet. And so it's really, really nice to see you here. And some of you have come across from the river. <laughs> work for government and your legal counsel and it's really really nice to see you here so I was kind of nervous about speaking today because these are really complicated and complex issues so to look around and see so many friends makes me feel pretty good so <laughs> thank you all for coming I wanted to put up this picture of Harry Daniels because an important point uh, that was just made by Eric is that the law abstracts us from who we are. Okay. The law abstracts us from who we are. And some of what I'm going to talk about today is going to hurt some people who are here. 
because you have a pretty strong sense of who you are as a Métis person. Or you have a pretty strong sense of who you are as a First Nations person. But the law, for a very long time, has been engaged in outside naming. And what it's been trying to do in some of these cases over the last 10 years is get our understanding of who an indigenous person is in law back in connection with reality, with how indigenous people see themselves and how they're connected to the land. Okay? So what we're going to see happen is we're going to see different definitions of who we are or who a person is as Indian or Métis through the eyes of the law that we're not necessarily going to agree with. So it's important to keep the faces of people like Harry Daniels in our minds because these are people who are affected by these decisions as Eric brought forward in his discussions. So the declaration that I'm going to focus on today in my talk in terms of the uh, implications, the potential implications of this decision, are going to focus on the first declaration, which is the declaration that the Métis and non-status Indians are Indians under Section 9124. This is still a very live issue because it was appealed on February 6th of this week. However, there were also declarations sought in relation to fiduciary duty. The court said yes in theory. For those of you who are following this area of the law, this is a live issue in the Manitoba Métis Federation case. We hope to have a decision down from the Supreme Court of Canada very soon. However, one of the issues before the Supreme Court is whether a court can actually even hear this case or whether it will be barred by a limitation period. The other issue that the court was struggling with but chose not to declare upon is consultation and negotiation. This again is a very live issue before the Supreme Court in Manitoba Métis Federation, before Alberta courts in Peavine, before the Court of Appeal yesterday in Hearst Court on Métis hunting rights. All of it relevant. So what I'm going to talk about today are really these last three issues. Are the implications of this decision potentially enormous? What are the implications for this constitutional logjam that's been created by ping-ponging back and forth since 1982 on the issue of who has jurisdiction? And let's talk about theory and let's talk about reality, because this is going all the way to Supreme Court. Okay? And what might the ramifications be? So this is part of a bigger presentation. I'm just going to hop through to where I want to start, which is this question. Why the exclusion? Well, we have such strong historical arguments. <coughs> Why the exclusion? Well, we have to remember in 1982, when Aboriginal rights were recognized in the Constitution of Canada, the argument was Section 82 was just this big empty box. And we had no idea what was in it. We didn't know what Aboriginal rights were, and we did not know what legal or financial implications would flow therefrom. So at this time, Justice Crosby, <coughs> has given an opinion to the minister in which he indicates that the federal government's position on excluding non-status Métis peoples appears to have been motivated by policy concerns for concrete actions and concerns for the financial consequences of recognizing this jurisdiction. A quote taken out of the Daniels case and accepted in that case as to why policy was changing. Well, what's the result? The result of this is dispossession of land through settlement, squatting, <coughs> problems with strip distribution. Only 1% going to Métis claimants, 
in Saskatchewan. Some of this wonderful work coming out of the research my colleague Frank Tuff is doing on script work. Poverty, illness, lack of education, homelessness, jurisdictional log gems, governments refusing to take responsibility, ongoing deprivation and discrimination. It's only in Alberta where the province is prepared to assume some jurisdiction even though its ability to do so under the Constitution is unclear. And through their jurisdiction over property and civil rights, civil rights, pardon me, they enter into negotiation with the Alberta Federation of Métis Settlements to enact Métis Settlements legislation. Now there's a whole history behind this we don't have time to get into. There is some motivation related to $8 billion worth of oil and gas and appropriation of funds that were to be put into a Métis Betterment Trust Fund that were not. So there was motivation for negotiation. The provincial government chose to assert its jurisdiction under property and civil rights. They knew they might have a problem because it was not clear who had jurisdiction over Métis. But they focused on results that were best for the citizens of Alberta and for the Métis negotiating with them on these issues. The result is the Alberta Métis settlements in northern Alberta. The population of, this, uh, of these settlements are mixed. Some are descendants of the historic Métis nation. Some are descendants of other Métis peoples from northern Alberta who identified as Métis. And some are non-status. They coalesce together and made their arguments before the UN Commission, the end result of the Alberta Macy Settlements, enacted pursuant to provincial legislation. So let's talk about the implications of that bit of background. I'm going to look at it on both of these sides, and I'm going to try and wind up a quarter to two so we have lots of time for questions. Which is why I walked around looking for a watch, and I found it quite fascinating. I left mine in the shower today, Almost everybody handed me a cell phone. <laughs> but I was afraid the cell phone would go off, so I'm walking with the watch. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> so on one side we have constitutional issues, on the other side we have programs. So let's talk about constitutional issues and then let's talk about programs. Definition of an AT. Now, I could talk for half an hour on each one of these slides, but I'm not going to do that. But I'm happy to do that later with any one of you. How does Daniels describe Métis identity for the purpose of 9124? It says the scope of Indian must be consistent with the purpose and objects of 9124. The 9124 is a racial classification, and that the single most distinguishing feature of a Métis is Indianness. Oh my gosh, that just about killed me when I read that. And I'm sure there are many members from the Métis Nation who are reading that, and indeed I know they will be intervening on this definition as of a discussion I had yesterday. That's how current we are. <laughs> okay. Right? This definition makes sense for 9124, which is focusing on Indianness as a racial category. But when we start talking about Aboriginal rights, it's very important for us to remember Aboriginal rights are not racial rights. They are not ethnic rights. And this is where people always get it mixed up. Aboriginal rights <laughs> are not sourced in our ethnicity. Aboriginal rights are sourced in our existence as a collective people as a First Nation or as a Métis people. The institutions of those people and their connection to the land. Aboriginal rights are inherent rights. 
They derive from the existence of a people and their connection to the land at the time English or Canadian law is disrupting those relationships. They're not racial rights. 9124 may be about race, but Aboriginal constitutional rights do not. And the reason I emphasize this point is because Daniels is not saying Métis are culturally Indians. It is simply saying the term Indian in the Constitution Act is broad enough to include you. First Nations, Inuit, and Métis may, may, may all be Aboriginal under Section 35, but they have distinctive rights as Aboriginal peoples under these sections. The fact that you fall under 9124 does not mean you have Aboriginal rights under Section 35. Pauli is the case that talks to us about Section 35. Pauli is the case that recognized Métis rights don't flow from tracing to First Nation ancestry. Métis constitutional rights to hunt, fish, trap, how they are emerging now, flow from distinctive Métis communities and peoples. That has not changed. Daniel says Section 35 requires a necessity that the identification with one of the three Aboriginal groups leads to the exclusion from the other two, at least with respect to Section 35. Right? What about the constitutional logjams? My point on identity is just because one is an Indian under 9124 does not mean one automatically has entitlement to Aboriginal rights or programs based on Aboriginal rights. So what are the implications of Daniels for constitutional law jam? Under section 9124, the federal government has the ability to pass legislation that singles out First Nations and Indians, Indians under 9124, First Nations, Inuit, for special treatment. So they can pass the Indian Act. An issue now is whether or not the provinces can do this. Alberta Métis Settlements Act, Constitution of Alberta Amendment Act, Métis Settlement Protection Act, this is about as all about Métis as you can get. An issue is whether or not this is unconstitutional that Daniels is upheld. An issue is whether only the federal government could pass this legislation. One argument out there is a province can do it as long as it is ameliorating. That is, as long as, as, long as it is for the benefit of the Métis people. Cunningham supports that, and Daniel suggests that, although it does not rule on the Métis settlements. It says provincially run ameliorative programs which benefit Aboriginal people are permitted as held in Lovelace, suggesting we will find a way to maintain healthy, self-governing Indigenous systems, however we create them. Thank you very much. It's been there for 25 years. <laughs> okay. Now, if this went to the Supreme Court and they said for some theoretical reason it has to be unconstitutional, I'm sure we would start negotiating parallel legislation schemes with the federal government. Well, here's another issue. What about hunting laws? What about provincial hunting laws? If Métis have an Aboriginal right to hunt, which we know they do. And if Métis are under federal jurisdiction, who is it that can pass hunting laws to regulate Métis hunting? The feds, the provinces? Who is it? Well, the general law, law 
is that a province can pass what's called the law of general application to apply to anybody, like a traffic law. And that would be one. But once we start passing laws that affect Indianness, Metisness, whatever that Aboriginal right is, there needs to be permission to do that somewhere from the feds. It's got to be delegated from somewhere is the argument. That's what we call the cloak theory of constitutional law. And it's only through Section 88 that provinces are able to pass hunting laws. As well as under the natural resource transfer agreements. So the bottom line is this. I want to be able to say a couple of minutes about programs. I appreciate this is complicated, but let me take you to the bottom line. Possible implications of Daniels for Métis rights to come in a province of Alberta where they can establish it. Let's see what Hearst Corn says. We don't even know about the South right now. We're still figuring that all out where we can hunt. But immunity may very well be more extensive for Métis because Section 88 does not apply to them. And it is not clear if a province can pass laws to regulate hunting. Having said that, there's arguments on the other side. This is not an easy area of law. The argument on the other side is that the constitutional line between federal and provincial powers is like this dilapidated old fence. And that we can move between them as long as the province is not trying to terminate an Aboriginal right. There are many constitutional scholars who disagree with that. I don't know what the answer to this is. <clears throat> These are potential legal implications. So let me spend <coughs> four minutes on programs and services. When we talk about programs and services, there are programs and services which are rights-based, and there are programs and services which are offered based on people's uh, disadvantage or various policy program objectives the provincial or federal government may have. What's important to me are the rights-based ones to talk about a little bit. An example is resolution of claims. Métis and non-status people have been excluded from federal processes to resolve potential Aboriginal rights claims. Arguably, these kinds of processes will have to open up to them if they are under federal jurisdiction. We have some non-status peoples, for example, in Alberta, the Michelle Band, the Papas Chase, on whose land we enjoy our fee simple title today. We have some people who trace their indigenous heritage to the United States who cannot be recognized in Canada to bring their claims in Nova Scotia. And they can't get into these dispute resolution processes because they're excluded because they're not considered Indians under federal jurisdiction. So it's here where I see the most significant impact are the rights-based processes. Programs which are based on policy, financing, uh, policy objectives can be shut down just as easily as they can be started the wider that they expand. Went over time, sorry, even though I borrowed a watch. Thank you very much. <laughs> Eric. Wow, let's have some questions. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll take questions and uh, just direct your questions to one or the other or both of our speakers. Yes? Um, <clears throat> I like the presentation. Um, Excellent. My name is Lee Tom. I'm from the Kikonomi Chief Settlement. Now, I just want to make it clear: I'm not a student. I'm not. I'm just. Uh, I'm just. I profess to be a politician. I guess. I sit on the Kikonomi Council, and uh, I've been thinking about this for a while here. And I actually knew I was coming here today, and I'll make this quick. And usually, I know this is all the story. <laughs> I hit some key points here, and I picked some stuff up that were said. And first of all, uh, our main key distinct, of course, we're distinct. The provincial, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court of Canada said it already in Powley and in, in Lazard and in the Cunningham. The Cunningham case was a case where Bill C-31 were going after, um, um, they were um, 
taking status back because Bill C-31, uh, 35 said that you can take the mother's yep. generations back yep. or whatever. Yep. So now you have uh, Métis members holding a, a status card. Well, they said in the Cunningham case you can't have both. That solidified our distinction there. Yep. Now here we are six to eight months later and the federal courts are saying, well, we're Indians. <laughs> now, in that definition, we talk about definitions, shouldn't, shouldn't, couldn't the definition simply be Aboriginal? Yeah. Couldn't it not be the Indian Act with the Aboriginal Act and have sub-definitions for the rest? Why is it not that easy? Why is it, why is it that there's so much confusion here and that Joe Public in, in the tax-paying areas doesn't distinguish between Métis and First Nations? And we're all judged by the color of our skin, yet we are distinct. We are Alberta as much as anybody else. So education is huge for society itself. Nobody seems to know who Indians are. Very true back then and still true today. It's, it, to me, I'm not a scholar, I'm just trying to figure this out. I'm looking at it from 30 feet above and I can't believe that, that we are sitting here and there's a bunch of educated, well-rounded people in this room but we're not pushing our fingers on the reality. And the reality is definition, definition, and Métis people searching for identity for a hundred years, and we're still searching for that same identity today. And the courts are telling us who we are. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't mean to offend anybody, because you probably are going to be lawyers and your students. I'm not. I got four kids and I'm a politician. Right. I was a crane operator before this, but I'll tell you what, and I'll make it quick. The Métis distinct. Supreme Court said it. Federal courts are now saying we're Indians. Definition. Definition should be Aboriginal. Sub-definitions. So are we now saying that the Indian, are, are the Inuits are Indians also? Because that's probably what's going to be next. And is the idea of assimilation that we're all Indians, then we can all get assimilated? I don't know. Hey, can I reply to a couple of things you said? Can I just wrap yeah, wrap it up. <laughs> wrap it up. Um, I like the guys from Kikino. They always have something to say. I want to talk about one thing that I heard about poverty. Poverty. And poverty in Alberta today. And we still have the poverty. It's still here. Poverty in Aboriginal communities. Lack of opportunity. Lack of education. And nobody wants to take responsibility. Mm. Don't you think that the federal government is doing a little lack of due diligence here over the years mm. on these treaties? Mm. I mean, due diligence on the federal government's part. Not only just pointing the finger at the, the, the Aboriginal people and saying they are where they are today because it's their fault. Some of that due diligence is missed on their part. So, I think we're running out of gas. Are you uh, sure? <laughs> I just wanted to say to that, to that point that, you know, we can't be all painted with the same brush. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. No, disrespect to our to our, our First Nations brothers. We can't be all painted. We are distinct. We are recognized. And, and it, it, it troubles me that, that I can go buy a vehicle today, and when I'm sitting to do the paperwork, the salesman asks me, where's your status card? I ask him, are you from Alberta? Like, well, you don't pay taxes, do you? I'm going to respond to a couple of things you said and then I want to open up a bit more for questions, not because I don't think you and I could have conversations for a couple hours. Hey, that's good if you're around, let's talk some more. I just, I know there's a class coming in, so I want to make sure that we, we have, uh, oh, there isn't any, yeah, there isn't any more, excellent, I can calm down. Let me respond to two things, first, uh, first of all, say welcome from Kikino. I actually had members of the Métis Settlements Appeal Tribunal in my class a couple of weeks ago with some of our friends, yeah, we were trying to get our, we were trying to wrap our heads around some of these decisions and what they might mean for the tribunal. Your comments really come back to outside naming a lot, which drives us all crazy. And in fact, you made the comment, well, what is it going to be the Inuit next? Well, guess what? It was actually them first. The Inuit, <laughs> the Inuit were, were assimilated into this idea of Indian under Section 9124 way back in the 1930s. But the benefit of that assimilation, and it, boy, what an oxymoron that is, benefit of assimilation, but what was going on at that point is interesting because it's very similar as to what's going on here and it was about benefits, access to health care, tuberculosis outbreak, 
who's responsible for helping to take care of people who are poor and dying in the north, okay? And so part of it was trying to figure out who has jurisdiction over the Inuit around that question, around that exact question, and some of the questions that we're trying to figure out today. With respect to obligations for things like safe drinking water, and it shouldn't matter if I'm a Métis settlement member or I live next door to the city of Edmonton or if I'm a First Nation living up in Fort Mackay area, we should all have safe drink wa drinking water. Now to me that's an equality rights issue. And one of the interesting things about everybody being brought under 9124, whatever we call them, and it drives me nuts that we're just, you know, trying to assimilate everybody under this one term. But whatever we call them, once we bring them all under 9124, we may have some basis for equality arguments to get provision of some of those fundamental services to everybody who is Aboriginal. So that's an interesting way to respond to that. Other questions? Comments? Yeah. That would be Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, one of the things that's a bit different about this case from other kinds of Aboriginal rights cases is that um, uh, the power over these people was always somewhere. It was always somewhere. No power has been created by this decision. What this decision says is, is that these people fall in this category of jurisdiction. And if they weren't there, they'd fall under provincial jurisdiction, right? So uh, it's a shifting of the government that's responsible, arguably. But it isn't a creation, I think, in any way of a new um, set of rights or, or issues that, and I think really my reading the Marshall was is that part of the public backlash to that case was that there was a sense that something new had been created a, a where, where something didn't exist not before. In truth. I think that's right. I think, yeah. yeah. And I'm not sure I agree either that the second clarification gutted the decision. I, I, you know, I think that decision stands. Uh, stands for what it stands for. But, um, you know, that, that's, I think, is a key difference. And I, you know, I don't think you're going to see boats crashing into boats uh, as a result of Daniels. That's, that would be my view. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I said the implications be for the Métis settlements being provincial jurisdiction as it goes back to the federal. <coughs> what would happen with that with the uh, natural resources and everything? Okay. Um, Here's what some of my thinking is on that right now. It may change in a few days, but here's what I'm thinking on this. Actually, it won't change in a few days. Here's what I'm kind of thinking on that right now, but I'm researching it. There are two ways that we can think about the Métis settlements. Well, there's three ways we can think about the Métis settlements legislation. <coughs> the first is, when we look at what the Supreme Court of Canada said in Cunningham, the Métis Settlements legislation, even though it's not about Aboriginal rights, it helps fulfill a purpose of Section 35, which is to protect a distinctive Métis people 
and a distinctive self-governing Métis people entitled to determine their own membership. We know that from reading Cunningham, Supreme Court of Canada. So they said, although it's not about Section 35 Aboriginal rights, and it's not because the province would not have had the jurisdiction to enter into a treaty or terminate any Aboriginal rights, even though it walks and quacks like a duck, it's not a duck, okay? Because the province theoretically wouldn't have had jurisdiction to do that. But it has many important elements in it that are important for maintaining the distinctiveness of the Métis people who are on the settlements, you know there's other Métis people, and their government, and their way of life. So given all of that, and its ameliorative purpose that has been upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada, they will do what they can to uphold the meeting settlements. My question is, how are they going to do it? I'm not quite sure yet the way I think they're going to do it. <laughs> this is why I say when we think about things, these things, we must think in theory and we must think in reality on the ground. There's two ways I think they may do it. One is this idea that you can single out a people within federal jurisdiction as long as it is ameliorating, as long as it is for their benefit. Going back to that old Lovelace case, which was pre, not, like it's like 1982 or something. Were some of you born there? 1982. <laughs> a little while back, right? So going back to this idea, we can probably uphold the Métis settlements as ameliorative legislation. Now, uh, and I don't believe those same arguments can apply to hunting rights, and I'll have discussions with my constitutional law colleagues from across the river another time, I'm sure, on that issue. But I don't think we can apply that to rights, but they do so. So the other way I think that it could be upheld is if the, the Supreme Court of Canada takes a very sort of watertight compartment approach to what is federal jurisdiction and what is provincial, and says, as a result of Daniels, and it goes all the way up, which is going to take at least 10 years. At which point, the meeting settlements will have been happily operating for at least 30 months. <coughs> anyway, go all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada. If they say it's unconstitutional, then what will happen is the Supreme Court of Canada will probably say, we'll put our decision on hold for a while, and then the federal government will pass legislation that is the same as the provincial or something like that. They did that with the NISPA Treaty. In order to implement the NISPA Treaty, we have provincial legislation and we have federal legislation. So what I'm trying to say in my answer to you in a very complicated way is by the time this gets to the Supreme Court of Canada, it's going to be at least another 10 years. There's issues on the settlements, but they still operate well. And I don't see anybody turning for some constitutional legal theory. There will be a way, and it may be, and I'm not saying the law is just fussy and does what it wants. I'm saying the arguments are there, and they'll be more persuasive, I think, uh, in relation to Métis settlements. Is there another hand that I saw? There's a question. Well, I think the, I mean, uh, you, you may uh, disagree with this, but I, my reading of the Section 35 cases is that the court's pretty careful to recognize not sovereignty of Aboriginal peoples. I mean, they may well have that sovereignty, but the Supreme Court of Canada um, is careful not to use that very phrase, I think, because <coughs> they are aware that, that there's another branch of the Constitution that gives jurisdiction over Aboriginal peoples, right? And in particular, Section 9124. So, uh, I, you know, I think Aboriginal rights, what the courts have said in under Section 35 is that Aboriginal rights are about reconciling pre-existing occupation of North American lands with crown sovereignty. And that's always an assertion of power and authority that I think the court is not prepared to, to question. So I don't, I don't know that, that creates a tension, at least, at least for the, the jurisprudence of the, of the Supreme Court. It may be wrong, but
but I don't think the court's going to have to wrestle with that very, very hard because I don't think they recognize Aboriginal sovereignty, maybe in, in the way you're suggesting. Yeah, yeah. I think what's really important to understand about Alberta Metis Settlements legislation and that is that it was not intended to respond to an assertion of Aboriginal land rights. Okay? Even though some of what is established through that system of land holding and self governance is very similar to what we'll see. Uh, among the Yukon First Nations, for example, that they've negotiated, uh, and more than what we'll see as to some others have negotiated in British Columbia, okay, in terms of their title rights, resource rights, self-determination. Even though those elements are there, it was not negotiated as an Aboriginal rights agreement. And in fact, the Constitution says it is not such. What that means is that your land rights have not been negotiated and resolved for Métis peoples in the, the entire province of Alberta. Now having said that, as a practical matter, any negotiation is going to take into consideration some of what was achieved in a result-based approach, knowing that this was about maintaining Métis, Métis distinctiveness. But does that mean that that land settlement will now be sufficient to satisfy the claims of all Métis people in Alberta? I would suggest no. That's why I would answer that question. In sort of a practical context. Yes? First, let me come back to the assumption of distinct treatments. Then I'm going to come back to the idea of uh, Métis identity and the debate around Métis identity in the eyes of the law. Uh, I'm not sure that they were distinct treatments. In fact, there are instances of uh, Métis people uh, being placed in residential schools. There was indeed a reserve that is similar uh, to a residential school called St. Paul's Métis, which was established just outside of Alberta. Uh, many Métis and non-status people um, had similar experience, but I would not equate them by any means to the experience um, that First Nation Inuit had in terms of uh, some of them being forcibly taken from their homes and put into residential schools. Uh, having said that, uh, some Métis people have gone through the residential school experience. In terms of uh, being treated differently uh, under federal policy in the enactment of their jurisdiction on and off, sometimes they entered into treaty. They were part of Treaty 3. Sometimes they were incorporated into the Indian Act and then excluded from the Indian Act. Uh, sometimes um, they were offered either treaty or script, such as in Northern Alberta. Having said that, within that history, as you say, <laughs> there was a very distinctive people who emerged out of the Red River, the Métis Nation. And those Métis Nation coalesced as a political identity. And they had a flag and a language. And they negotiated their way into Confederation through the Manitoba Act, which is what I believe but we're not sure what the Supreme Court counts to say on that one yet. But I believe that. My history. There exists basically the Métis Nation. 
and they have many distinctive arguments as the Métis Nation. And that is why they will intervene on this case and say you cannot say the essence of me is Indianness, no matter what theoretical arguments are around the Constitution. However, where I and my very, very dear friends in the Métis Nation disagree, and have for 25 years, is on the question of to whether the only Métis are the Métis Nation. There are self-identifying populations that have emerged in northern Alberta and northern Saskatchewan that do not necessarily connect to the Red River who have been recognized in law as Métis, and I too recognize them as Métis. So that's, I'm sorry it's such a long answer to your question, but these are incredibly sensitive issues. And so when I answer a question about Métis identity, it's really important for me to be sensitive to the views that are in the room. Well, I'm looking at, at the time and realizing that many people are having to leave. And so perhaps what we'll do is bring our very fascinating and interesting session to a close. And if any of you want to stay and ask questions of our speakers, I think probably they would both be uh, willing to do that. So, yes. Uh, I, I will look at my presentations, um, part of what's happening with my presentations is that I've had to put these together so fast running about that some of the visuals would be, would be copyrighted for this purpose, but not any other. Um, having said that, too, I do plan to write and publish all these things. If you're interested, see before I do Alberta, I'll send you what I can. Or contact us through Patricia and we will send you what I can and we'll keep you updated on the stuff that's coming up. And uh, if uh, Eric has something, he will share it too. So I just, before everyone leaves, want to thank our speakers for a very oh. interesting presentation. And we happened uh, to have gifts for you, uh, courtesy of the University of Alberta Press. So, uh, so thank you for the history and the <laughs>